yo, hey yo, hey yo, yo. Pack the chrome styles fly like Mrs. Jones. Lyrical mathematics will have the devil smoking stones. I put heads to bed, lick shots and rappers fled with the church a few times. No, like whatever she's doing. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Today we're gonna talk about query execution. Um, just as a reminder, for the last class or the last two lectures, we've been talking about how to minimize the amount of data that we're retrieving. Yes. Okay, cool. All right, so last class, or last two classes, we spent time talking about how we minimize the amount of data we have to read from disk in order to execute queries when we're doing sequential scans. Right, again, we saw filters and indexes to identify things, we, blocks of data we don't need to read, and then uh, compression has allowed us to minimize the size or reduce the size of the, the data we do have to actually have to read and then try to process it uh, you know, in, in its compressed form if possible. So going forward for the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about now how do we actually start executing queries uh, and, and the ways we're going to be able to improve performance based on take, you know, taking advantage of, of, of you know, modern CPU architectures and modern algorithms. So uh, I showed this list before, but these are a bunch of the different techniques we can do to speed up sequential scans. So again, data skipping was, uh, was the technique for, for, for identifying what you don't need. So now I'm going to go through a bunch of these ones uh, for the next couple of classes uh, and you know, build our system to take advantage of, of, of these methods. So at a high level, basically what this class is about and what database system engineering is all about is, is an or orchestration or the implementation of a bunch of these different optimizations that are going to be designed to take a full advantage of, of the hardware. So there isn't going to be one technique that, I, that you'll be able to take away from this class and say, oh, this is the one thing I should always be using every time I build a database system. It's going to be a combination of things. And in some cases, we'll see that, that some techniques are, you know, are, are interface with each other quite nicely. In other cases, you have to do a little extra work in order to do one with, along with another. All right, so the example would be like you want to do vectorization uh, plus the, the push-based method for query execution, as we'll talk about today then you have to do some extra stuff to make, to make that work, All right? So this is not a, uh, you know, my, my list here of what, what I think the top three optimizations that, like, that I think we're gonna go through that are gonna matter the most, this is not scientific. This is just my, uh, it's my personal opinion from reading the papers and seeing what other systems do and how things are implemented and some of the experiments that we've, we've done here, but I don't have like, you know, this ranking is definitive because obviously it depends on a you know, bunch of different factors. But the three optimizations that are going to matter the most for us this semester are going to be vectorization, uh, parallelism with, with multi-threading or multi-core, and then code specialization or query compilation. This one, the code compilation stuff, is probably the hardest one to do, uh, both to actually implement and actually debug. And this is why most systems aren't going to do this, or they do small very. Um, uh, the portions of this in a query plan, like Postgres will do this for the where clause, whereas like single store will compile the whole query. Again, we'll cover what all that means as we go along. But vectorization is probably going to be the top two here, probably the, be the biggest win. But the performance benefits you can get with compilation it can be quite significant. All right, so if you want to optimize the execution of a database system while we execute queries, what's the goal? Like we should think about what do we actually want to achieve other than saying, hey, my query runs faster. What's actually going on in the system to actually achieve that, that reduction in, uh, in, in the query execution time? We've already said with data skipping, we're reading less data from disk, so of course that's going to be faster. But for the data we do have to go read and now it's in memory, what, what can we actually do to speed things up? Or how, how are we actually going to achieve this? So there's basically three goals here, the three things we want to target. So the first one is that we want to reduce the instruction count. And that this means that as we execute queries, we're going to use fewer instructions to, to execute them. Compiler can help with this. The code specialization can help with this. Uh, but it's, it's sort of obvious, right? If I can basically use less instructions to produce the same result, that's, of course I'm going to run faster. Um, you can pass an O2 to, to, you know, to your compiler to, to, to speed things up. Um, and that, you know, the compiler will help along with this, but there's other sort of fun, fundamental things we want to do. Uh, in our database system to achieve this. You typically don't want to ship your database system with O3. Uh, I don't think anybody, actually, I, I can't prove this, but like this is sort of well known in systems that you don't want to, you know, O2 is about as far as, how, about a, as, far as you want to go into sort of aggressiveness on, on compiler optimizations you want to have. Um, and just to prove that it's not just databases, uh, this is a, a, a mailing list post from Linus uh, from 2021 
And it basically says here is, is uh, oh, sorry, I clicked it. Uh, well, that, that's a spoiler. Uh, I personally think O3 is, is in general, is unsafe, right? So, so again, O2 optimizations will help us reduce instruction counts. Um, and maybe O3 could be a little better, but you know, it, we could have problems that we, we don't want to ship our code with, you know, with, with bad machine code and, and have problems. So O2 is about far as we're going to go. So there'll be other things we'll have to do in our, in our own implementation. All right, so assuming we've done uh, number one, now we're going to figure out how can we reduce the uh, number of cycles we're going to, we're going to take to execute instructions. I'm going to take a guess of how, how we can do this. Nothing? Gee, I'm disappointed. SIMD? Well, SIMD will, will get you number one, right? Because you know, if I, I, I apply a predicate, right, like instead of doing it in, I mean, with SISD four times, I can do it all maybe one in a single. So this is what approach to the like, uh, branching might cause a lot of like Bingo, yes. Yes, so he said, uh, well, the problem you can have during, in your CPU is that uh, with branching or uh, stalls because something's not in your, in your cache because the cache misses, like those are going to lead to increased increase cycles uh, that were spent for an instruction. So it's the same amount of instructions, whether or not you have to, the CPU has to stall because it has to fetch something from cache or not, or from memory and bring it to the cache, right? Like that'll determine how many cycles you're going to spend. And the other one he, he mentioned was branching would be another one. We'll see this in a second. That like if we, if the the CPU wants to try to do speculative execution and predict what branch you're going to go down, if it gets it wrong, it has to roll things back and then flush the pipeline and bring things back in, right? So that's going to take a lot more cycles. So again, we'll see an example in a second where we can design our our database system as we're executing predicates to to reduce this. Again, it's the same amount of work producing the same result. We're just taking less cycles, right? And the last one is, is obvious that we want to parallelize the execution of, of, of the queries, either through multiple cores, multiple threads. Uh, we're not talking about distributed systems just yet, but across different, different machines. Right? Again, this is why I like the blog article I sent you guys on Piazza last night from the DuckDB people is the guy basically at BigQuery says most people didn't actually need BigQuery at right? the scale that they were trying to you know, market it as. And that DuckDB was probably good enough for most people running on a single node. Right? So we're not going to get faster clock speeds, although Intel is getting a bit aggressive. I think they're up to 6 gigahertz now for the, some of the latest ones. But in general, the way we're going to get uh, better performance or, or more computational power out of mo modern CPUs is going to be through more cores. So we want to design our database system to be able to, to run our queries on multiple cores. Right? All right, so just to make sure that we're, we have the, all the same language going forward. Uh, so it's going to define some basic terms of, of you know, what's in a query and what we're talking about. So a query plan is going to be a just directed acyclic graph of a bunch of these operators. Um, for now, we can ignore whether it's a physical operator or a logical operator. We'll cover that later on. But just, you know, a join operator, a scan operator, and so forth, right? And then we're going to say a operator instance would be the invocation of one of these operators in our query plan at runtime as we actually execute the query. All right, and so if, I, if I'm scanning table A, uh, the operator at high level would be you know, scan table A, but the operator instance could, could have multiple of them that are each scanning a different partition or segment of A. And then at some point in, in the system, I'll have to be able to coalesce the results and put those things back together from the different operator instances. We'll cover that in a second. And then so now the, the unit of computation when we do scheduling and organize the of these operating instances is going to refer to this as, as a task, also called a pipeline. And this is going to be some sequence of operators that we can execute in, in sequential order, one after another, uh, again, on some core or some thread. So in this example query here, I'm joining A and B on a simple uh, join clause with a, with a where clause with a, a, a value and a B value. The, um, the two pipelines would be here, right? So I'd have a pipeline one scan A, and then do the, do the filter, and then produce some output, say, to build the hash, do my hash join, build the hash table here. And then the second pipeline here would scan B, do the filter, probe the hash table, and if the tuple matches, then do the projection coming out of it. 
So in this case here, I, the, the system is going to know it has a, has a dependency that pipeline two can't run until pipeline one completes, because right? I don't I can't do a probe into the hash table until I, the hash table is populated, because otherwise I could have a, I could have a false negative. So the system is going to know I have these these tasks or these pipelines. It can schedule them, and then it can have multiple invocations of the same pipeline with different op operator instances because they're operating on different amounts of table or different 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 parts of, of the input data. Okay. All right, so today's class, we're going to talk about the, the MoneyDB uh, X100 paper you guys read. And again, to me, that's the, that's the, yes, it is from 2005, but as I said, the other papers we read, these are the fundamental papers that really lay out the key ideas that are the backbone of the design of, of modern OLAP systems. Um, and vector-wise, this paper is very, very influential. And then we'll spend more time talking about different processing models, uh, how do you actually organize the flow of data, throughout the DAG and the, and the query plan, and we'll finish up talking about the, the basic levels of, of parallel execution you can have, okay? All right. So, um, all right, so this, because this paper, as I said, it's, it's old, but again, it's, it's, it's the fundamentals of, of, this, of this sort of vectorization approach. Um, so this paper describes a improved version of ODB, they call it X100, uh, where they, they showed how existing database systems at the time were not, not built to target modern superscalar CPUs. And that, and that if you redesign the database system to better target what the CPU actually expects or wants in terms of instructions that are given to it and data, then you can get much better performance. Yes? Uh, does this satisfy the three optimizations we talked about? This question is, does this satisfy the three optimizations that we talked about? In this case, for this paper, yes, because you'll, you can execute fewer instructions. We'll talk about how Vectorwise does compilation. It wasn't fewer instructions, right? Was it? When I read it, was it, most, it, was, it was focusing on the cycles. But like, there's, there's background of how Vectorwise, which is what X100 became, of how they do compilation to do predicate evaluation. That's going to allow them to execute fewer instructions. Uh, well, we take this offline. I have to look at that again. Yeah. So, but I see the, the main takeaway of what you guys give this paper is like this this idea of, uh, you know, that there's this that that humans oftentimes build database systems or software systems in general that in such a way that's easy for humans to reason about and understand when they actually implement it. But oftentimes the way that's easier for a human to understand how the system actually works and implement it is actually the worst way for, for running it on a CPU. And that although it's going to be more engineering work, which is fine because it's hard to do and therefore they hire CMU students, they pay them a lot of money to do this, uh, it's, you're going to get way better performance if you write the system based on what the hardware actually expects and wants. Right? So now in this case, this paper, it's, it's dated, right? They talk about uh, the Itanium CPU, which I'm assuming most of you have never heard of. Actually, who, who here has heard of Itanium before this paper? Two of that. Well, you work on compilers, so, right? Itanium basically was this, this collaboration between Intel and HP in the 2000s that they, it was going to be a replacement for x86. Uh, and, but it was around for, for, it basically had some interesting things, but like none of the compilers actually supported it. No one actually ever switched over. That's why x86 is still dominant. Right, at least for now. Anyway, so so they 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 were it was still a super scalar CPU, meaning that they had these long pipelines of uh, of instructions uh, that you could sort of queue up, and that the the system was going to try to uh, you know, try to keep that pipeline always full and try to maybe speculate execute things instructions so that it didn't have to flush it and and go fetch a you know, whole new batch of instructions from, from memory and put that in. So uh, back in the day when this paper was written, like the Pentium 4, the Nehalem architecture, uh, had these massive pipelines, like 31 stages. It's gone down to like, it's made, like I think it's like the latest, like 20 or something like that. It's more complicated than today because like the latest Intel CPU, uh, was like Raptor Lake from like 2022, it has both efficiency cores and performance cores and they have different number of pipelines. Like things are getting really wild now, but the basic idea is still the same, right? That like, there's in these modern superscalar CPUs, you you never want to have to have uh, you know flush the pipeline and go fetch other stuff, go fetch instructions, 
right? And so in this, in this paper basically describes, again, the, the, here's the way you can, you can design the system to do analytical queries that's going to be most efficient for what the, what the CPU expects. Um, and so based on these findings in, in their experiments, they built this new prototype called X100. This was later renamed as VectorWise, uh, and they spun it out of the university as CWI. VectorWise was acquired by Actin in 2010. Um, and when I used to teach this course, I used to say, oh yeah, you know, Actin acquired and they killed it off because like, when you try to like, search for it, you couldn't find it on their website. And then somebody from the company emailed me and complained and said, oh, it does actually exist. They brought it back. Um, so now it's just called Vector, which I think is a terrible name. Because uh, you, you search Vector Database. That is a class of databases. Right? Uh, true story, the, the first name of VoltDB uh, that Sternbreaker wanted to use, he wanted to call it The SQL. Because it was supposed to be The SQL to Oracle. Right? But like, you search SQL Database, like the S-E-Q-U-E-L, that would be a terrible thing to search for. So you call your thing vector database. That's a terrible thing to search for too, right? Whatever. So then, then the the avalanche is the name of the the hosted cloud version, and then uh, this is Marcin Zakowski and Peter Bontz, or you know worked in this project. Marcin then went off and found a Snowflake, and so a lot of these ideas that are that are in this paper you guys read is what showed up in Snowflake, and then Peter Bontz is is involved in DuckDB as well right now. So again, so this is, this paper is very influential. So I'm going to give you a quick crash course of uh, everything you need, you need to know about CPUs for databases in, in, in two slides. And we'll see how it goes. And of course, things are becoming more complicated. We can ignore GPUs. Uh, we'll ignore FPGAs. You know, those things are, I don't think GPUs will, but FPGAs are, are showing up in databases a little bit more now. Um, that might be something you have to consider, but let's, let's assume we're just, everything's still running on the CPU today. Okay, so the way the CPU organized, again, organized is, is instructions is through these pipeline stages. And so the goal of having a superscalar architecture is that because you have all these different components in the system, like for the, to do computation, that you want to keep these things uh, busy at every single cycle. And so you don't want to have, uh, you know, you don't want to have like this, this, the CPU completely stall because you have to fetch something from memory. So you can peek ahead maybe in the instructions and try to execute things ahead of time. And that way you're using all parts of the CPU as much as possible, right? And so in the modern super CPUs, they'll have multiple pipelines and multiple instructions and they are allowed to execute things out of order. But in x86, they're gonna be really strict and make sure that, uh, that like the, the, the results of memory matches up with what happens if you execute things in sequential order. So there's a bunch of mechanisms to make sure that this is, the, the things always track correctly. I think ARM relaxes this a bit. Um, but if you're going to allow to do out of order execution, you have to have checks to make sure that did things end up being what I thought they were going to be if I executed things sequentially. Similar to like specular execution and like optimistic concurrent goal and transactions. Right? So what will happen is like if, uh, if you start, the CPU starts executing things out of order, uh, say because there's like a conditional branch and, and then a jump. And so you, it makes, try to make a prediction whether it's going to go through that jump or not. And then if it starts executing things based on that, that, that prediction, if it then finds out that the prediction was incorrect, it has to throw away all its, the results it's computed and then roll back and then jump back to where it should have been. And that usually requires a, a pipeline flush because you've got to go fetch with the instructions you should have brought in instead of the ones you, you assumed you were going to bring in. So everything is great with all this out of order execution. Is, is fantastic until th there's a problem, until it gets it wrong. Um, and so this can occur in, in, in basically two ways. So one is if there's a dependency between the instructions, like the output of, of one instruction is then used as the input for the next instruction, then it, you obviously can't do out of order execution for that because you have to wait to see what the output is before you execute the next thing, right? So there's no really easy way to, for a designer database system to avoid this, right? If, if the output of an operator uh, is a tuple that then the next operator wants to do some processing on, we can't speculate execute the next operator, the next set of instructions, because we need to know what the output is, right? So there's not much we can do for the first one. The second one is the problem that he mentioned, where if the, the CPU is going to try to predict what path we're going to go down when there's a conditional, uh, if it gets it wrong, then it has to flush the pipeline and roll back. 
and then, and then start things again. And that filling the pipeline is expensive. Now we're talking like nanoseconds here, but again, if you're doing this for a billion tuples over and over again as you're doing a scan, this becomes very expensive. It's, you know, basically, it, it, you know, the CPU is going to run you know, 3x slower than it, than it should have. All right? So I've already sort of said what's the use case where you know, this is going to matter a lot. It's when we start doing scans and start evaluating, pre evaluating predicates. That's clearly a conditional. And then the, the, the whether or not that conditional is going to evaluate to true depends on what the data actually looks like, the database itself, the tables, and also to what is the predicate. And so the, the, the branch misprediction component, or the branch predictor in, in CPUs are super, uh, very sophisticated and can do amazing things. But this is, for databases, this is really hard because it's, it's for every query could be different and every database could be different. It's really hard to bake in exactly, uh, you know, logic to say for this database, here's what you should be doing. And the branch prediction algorithms are, are secret. This is not something that like Intel, AMD share. So what happens when it goes wrong, right? Because we have these long pipelines and wants to execute these two branches, right, it's going to hide the stalls when we have dependent instructions. But then the, when we start doing, again, the scan, as I already said, the CPU is going to have a hard time predicting whether this is, you know, we are going to fall down if, if clause or not to say, yes, this tuple matched my predicate. So one way to get around this potentially, or in theory, is in C++, there's these likely and unlikely keywords. Uh, GCC has their own intrinsic built in, and then now the C++ standard has this. And so this is, this is in the old days, this used to be actually a hint to the CPU, but since like 2006, the, the CPU actually ignores it. Like Intel, like it'll, the compiler will generate an opcode for this, but in, Intel ignores it, the x86 ignores it. All right, so this is just a hint to the compiler that to try to put the, the branch that is most likely to happen contiguous with the, the main block of code. Because again, that's a sequence of instructions that's better for the CPU instead of having to do jumps. Right? As far as I know, no database system actually uses this. Uh, there is another blog article from a compiler engineer at, at, uh, at Intel that says, don't do this. Right? So we're basically left up to us as the database system to try to figure out how to get around this problem. Right, because we, you know, we can't tell the compiler anything, and we can't tell the CPU anything, right? So the way we can do this is by avoiding the thing that's causing the problem, the branches. Say we have a simple query like this, select start from table, key is greater than, uh, than low, low value, and key is less than high value. So a basic implementation, probably what you implemented for, for project one, would look like this. Right, iterate every, every tuple on my table, go grab the key I want to do my predicate on, then I have my if clause. If key is greater than uh, low value and key is less than high value, then copy the, the, the tuple in, in my output buffer. Right? So what's, what's the line that's going to be the problem here for us? I've already said it. Yes? If it's the if statement, right? Because again, and think about it, I'm going through a billion tuples and uh, in worst case scenario, say it's, it's alternating every other one, or, you know, or it's completely random. Sometimes it's going gonna, it's gonna to predict that it's going to go in, and it's wrong. Sometimes it's going to predict it, it, that it shouldn't go in, and it's wrong too. So we can write, rewrite this, this simple sequential scan like this without any branches. So now what we have here is we're always going to copy the tuple in our output buffer, and then we'll go grab the key that we need, and then we're going to do uh, two ter ternary clauses where if the key is greater than low value, and then a one, otherwise zero, and then we end that with another ternary operation that says if the key is, is less than high value, then one or zero. And then by ending the, the, those two together, that gives us a delta value, and that tells us whether we should increment or offset into the output buffer by one. So what will happen here, if the, if the predicate doesn't evaluate to true, then delta is zero, and we come back around and copy it over again. Now, I, I'm missing the little extra work you have to do outside the for loop that says, you know, for the last one, you know, if, if this delta is zero, then I shouldn't have copied it and make sure I, I, I ignore it when I produce my output, right? But you get the high level idea. So again, like it's the same operation, it's just we designed our database system to divide this predicate in a way that's better for the CPU. And so there's this graph from, uh, this, is a, this is from the 2013 paper from Vectorwise, uh, where they show uh, for some large database, they vary the selectivity of the where clause 
with and without the, 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 the branching versus branchless approach that I showed before. And what you see is the, the red line is the, is the no branch line, and it's the same no matter what the selectivity is because you're always copying things in. And whether or not you know, it's, it's re retained in the output buffer or not, it doesn't matter. In the case of the branching case, the, the, the branching implementation, you see that it actually performs better uh, when the selectivity is low, I think roughly about 5%, right? But then beyond that, the, the branch pr prediction is actually causing the problem, and it's just taking way longer to, to process every tuple. And there's obviously a huge hump in the middle because that's when like, it's 50-50, it's, 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 it's a coin toss whether it should match or not. And then the CPU is just, just mispredicting all the time. And then there's a small little blip over here where like at 100%, uh, it, just, it just does better. Yes? Uh, if you can change it slightly, so we still are copying all of the outputs, right, in the black branch method. So how do we control the selection of the copy T from an output of I? Is it going to copy every? So the question, is, like, the question is, how do I make sure that I don't copy the things I shouldn't be copying? Yeah. So, so say the output, the output is just a buffer, right? Of, of, it's just an array, assuming everything's fixed line. So it's this delta here, right? So I'm copying the tuple always into whatever my next position is. But, it, but if, I to, if, I, if I match the tuple when I come back around, the position is incremented by one, so I copy to the next, the next position in, in the output buffer. If it evaluates to, to false, meaning and the delta goes to zero, when I come back around, I just overwrite the last thing I copied in. So that, that avoids having any false positives in my output buffer. And again, I have to have a little extra stuff in the, outside the for, call, the for loop to say, was my last one tr you know, true, true or false? If not, then remove it or ignore it. So this seems counterintuitive, right? As a human, like, oh, I'm copying things over, over and over again. But it turns out, in assuming everything fits in memory, as in this example here, that this is actually better because it's better for the CPU. And I'm pointing out here also, too, that it's the, the thing they're measuring is CPU cycles per tuple. So you're getting, uh, you know, this is roughly just under, under uh, four cycles per tuple. Worst case scenario, you're up to almost like 10 or 11. So almost a 2x performance difference. So again, this is a good example of designing a, the database system to, to, in a way that the human would, would naturally write. But if we understand what the CPU wants from us, or what it expects, or the best case scenario for it, we, we, can, we can implement uh, you know, better algorithms. OK. So in terms of reducing the number of instructions, uh, we'll, see, we'll talk more about this when we talk about query compilation and the specialization. But the basic idea is that when you think of like something like Postgres and MySQL and, and, and other database systems, uh, that they're designed to be general purpose. And so they have this, all these sort of operator evaluations, a predicate evaluation code, where they deal with values um, in an abstract, sort of abstract way. Um, and then when they actually want to apply predicates or do whatever operation they want on it, then they have these giant switch clauses to say, if my, you know, the, the left side of my, of my evaluation or my, my, my predicate is if it's an integer and the other side is, is an integer, do this, or my data type is, is this type, or my value is this data type, do that, right? And you see in, in, these, in these systems, these giant switch statements to deal with these different, di different data types, right? Because it's, it's, it's basically being interpreted. It's not, like, it's, it's trying to say, I have this data type, here's, here's the, the memory size, the offset, and here's the type, and then there's, there's something that says, okay, I know how to d take that data and do, and do you know, add two together or so forth, uh, add two of them together. So the problem with this one now is, again, now we have much more branches because of, of these giant switch statements. Uh, and the, the CPU is not going to be able to easily predict what path you're going to take down in, the, in these switch statements all the time. For OLAP, maybe it's less of an issue, but there's still an overhead of like, setting, setting up the, the switch statement and looking into it and jumping and so forth. And that's just for like, native data types that we talked about, like the IEEE 754 standard, where this, the hardware actually has uh, instructions to do native operations on 32-bit integers. If you start talking about more complex things that are, that are implemented in the data system itself, like the Postgres numeric type, then, then you're, 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 you're just screwed because it's this giant function here with all these if clauses that the, the CPU is going to have a terrible time trying to predict what path you're going to go down. Again, this is just to add two numerics together. Right? So again, the, the, 
we want to design this, the database system when we do qu execute queries, ideally in such a way that we, 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 we reduce this generality or this general purpose nature of it and have exactly, like here's the code path you need to do if you're adding two integers together or evaluating two integers together. Code compilation is one way you want to do it. The vector-wise does sort of pre-compiled predicates. We'll, we'll see how we do this later on. Okay, right. so now we want to talk about how we're actually going to execute a query plan. And again, this is sort of at a high level, at a logical level, not so much, again, okay, what's actually in the physical operator instance, like what's the actual, how the, we implement the operator, but how are we going to move data from one operator to the next? All right, and this is, uh, again, if you took the intro class, we covered this, but we'll, we'll go a bit more detail uh, in, in, in these approaches. All right, so the first one is going to be the iterator model. Again, this will be the most basic one that every, most database systems implement. Materialization model is, uh, in my opinion, better for OLTP systems, but there are some OLAP systems that actually implement it. And then the vectorized batch model is what we're going to assume going forward that this is how we want to implement uh, to, you know, our processing model in our database system. And of course, there's, there's, there's pros and cons or benefits and disadvantages of these different approaches, but we'll, we'll, we'll describe it in the context of OLAP. So the iterator model is sometimes called the pipeline model or the, uh, the volcano model. Um, this is basically how the first databases were implemented in the 1970s. The Volcano paper came out, I think it's like early 90s, and it's the first one that sort of described the, the, the high-low idea of what this approach was actually doing. It basically gave the taxonomy and the, the, the nomenclature for describing what this is going to do. But it, it, just because the paper came out in 92, it's not like people weren't doing it before him. So the way it's going to work is that every query plan operator is going to have this next function, and on invocation, every time you call next on this operator, it's responsible for returning back the next tuple that in, you know, in, in, the, in its sort of stream of data that it's processing. Or if it, it reaches the end, it returns back a null to indicate that it has no more data. So the idea is that you start at the root of the query plan, you call next going down, and you're, 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 you're moving data up from, uh, from one operator to the next. It doesn't necessarily have to be from the top going down. We'll, we'll see how to go in the other direction. But for our purposes here, we'll, we'll assume it's from the top to the bottom. Right. So let's look at an example here. So say I have a query here. I want to join R and S, uh, and then I have a where clause on S value. So all these operators here will be just be implemented in these these little pseudo code. Again, I normally don't like to show code in in lectures, but these are simple enough that I think you guys can get it, and it's kind of hard not to do this. All right. So all of these are going to be the next functions for these different operators. All right. So to start executing this query. Assuming we're going from the top to the bottom, we'll start at the root, call next on the, the top child here, or the, the top operator, and then you see inside the for loop, the first thing it does is call next on its child. So that's going to go down and invoke this, this function here. Oops, sorry. I don't like not having a clicker, which I don't know what. I should buy a new one. All right, so, um, right, so, so then this calls down to this operator here for the join. Now you see we have two for loops. We have the, on the left child we call next to build the hash table, and the right child we call next to probe the hash table. So the first thing we do is call, call next on the left child. This comes down here. Uh, and inside this now we have a for loop we're going to iterate over the, the table. And for each invocation of next, we're going to send back a single tuple. We then probe our hash table, or sorry, build our hash table, and come back and do it again. And so once this thing, uh, the next call for this, this, this leaf operator here returns null, the, the parent operator at, at step two or knows that there is no more data that this guy is going to send us, so we don't need to call next on that. So then we drop down to the next for loop uh, on the right child, call next on that, it calls next on this child, it scans the table, and we, we move data up into the for loop, probe the hash table, and then push it up to, sorry, push it up to the, the parent up here. All right? Pretty straightforward. But again, the key thing is that we're moving one tuple at a time. So as I said, this is what most data systems will, will implement, especially in the OLTB world. OLAP, at least in modern OLAP systems, less so. Uh, and the nice thing about it is that it's going to allow for pipelining, uh, which is going to matter for in a disk-based system, meaning I want to be able to bring a tuple in from disk into memory and do as much work as I can on it uh, before I pass it along to the to, to or before I go back and try to get, get the next tuple. All right, so it's going back here. On this side of, of the query plan, for every invocation of this next uh, function here, 
I, I pass up a single tuple, then I immediately see what value is the predicate, then I can immediately see whether it matches the hash table, then I can then do the projection. So I, I didn't pause and have to put it into an intermediate buffer. I, I write it all the way up to the top. It keeps going for, for as long as it can go, uh, and, then, and then ideally then produce the output for, for the result of the query. What's also nice about this is that uh, uh, it's going to be really easy to do output control with this approach because if I have like a limit clause, I can have that be the root of the, of the query plan. And once it, you know, if it's like limit 10, once it gets all you know, 10 tuples, it doesn't call next anymore and just stop execution. All right? So you, can, you control how many tuples you're, you're producing and, and, and without having to materialize everything all at once. But we'll see problems in, in next approach because of that. So some of the, some of the operators have to block until the, or until the children emit uh, all their tuples. Um, you know, these are called like pipeline breakers. This just means that like, I can't probe the hash table until I build the hash table, as I said before. Or I can't do a limit on a sorted data set until I sort the data set. Right? So again, pretty much every single data system implements this approach. Uh, I'm, I'm showing, you know, th these, aren't, these, these, these are the major ones just thinking right at the top of my head. Well, I wouldn't call Impala. Impala's not, Impala's not a major system anymore. NeoDB got bought. They only had one customer. Like, but like SQLite, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, DB2, this is what they do, SQL Server. Yes. So when you say pipelining, is it like your proper pipelining where all these pages are in parallel? The statement is, the question is, uh, when I say pipelining, do I mean pipelining where all the stages are, are going in parallel? No, it, it just means, going back to my um, example in the beginning, I just mean that like there's a sequence of operations, operators. Uh, so the question is like, within a pipeline, when I say like, could you have one thread doing like one operator, another thread doing, that comes, that's intra, intra query parallelism, that comes later. We're not even there yet. This is like just, okay. this is just how you're moving data from one operator to the next. Okay. We'll get to then how, how you actually implement it with, with, when you want to have multiple threads. Yeah, I mean, so there's, there's a language issue. I say pipeline, this, the CPP is something different. I say lock, the OS people want, don't want, you know, I mean, it means something. Yeah. Or I say latch, the OSP will say lock. Um. Okay. All right, so the next processing model is called, again, materialization model. And you can sort of think of the iterator model and materialization model two, sort of two extremes of, of the design space. The iterator model for every single next call gives you back one tuple. From the materialization model for every admit call or next call, you get all the tuples. That the that the the operator wants to spit out, and then you never go back and ask for it more, right? So the this obviously has there's there's benefits and 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 uh, problems with this. Uh, one problem is as I said before, you can't control the output. Like if, if you want to say I only want ten tuples, but you call this operator on the scan and, and it produces a billion tuples, well then you got you got to push down or inline the limit clause to be aware of uh, so that that the operator knows not to produce more than it actually needs. Um, but then the advantage is that it's going to be less overhead of executing queries in terms of like function calls and, and jumps and branches and things like that because it's one invocation of the operator and you get all the results. Whereas if it's the iterator model, if I have a billion tuples coming out of the table, I got to call that, that function a billion times. And it doesn't sound like, you know, function call, how expensive could, could that be? If everything's in memory because uh, I've already fetched it in, then that's, that starts to add up. So it starts to be expensive. So, the, the output of, of all, I guess, really all these approaches could either be a the whole tuple or, or a subset of the columns. Um, for OLAP system, in, if it's a column store, it'll typically, depends on whether you're doing materialization or not, early materialization, it could be a subset, it could be the entire tuple. All right, so it's the same query we had before, but now in our functions here, we see that there's this, uh, there's, they're all defining an output buffer. They do whatever it is that they want to do in, in the operator in the for loop, and they just keep adding things to the output buffer, and then they, then they return it. So when I call next at the top here, right, I call for my child output. This thing then, the top thing blocks because it switches control over to this. Then I, do, I call my left child, get its output to build my hash table. 
uh, and again, I, I block until I get all the tuples. Then I, you know, I iterate over that, build my output. Then I go down the right side, do the same thing. You know, get you value all the predicate on this guy, but he has to go get all the the, the tuples from his child. And then this gets pushed up uh, like this. I right, guess so I'll see the blue lines are the control lines. The blue lines are like t the, the the parent operator is telling the child operator, "Hey, do something for me." And then the red line indicates this is the data flowing back up. Right, so it's the control flow versus versus the data flow. So in this case here. Uh, this is actually would be really inefficient to do it this way because all this operator is doing is just taking all the tuples out of S and putting it into an output buffer and then copying it into, uh, and this guy's just going to iterate over it again. So an obvious optimization here, you would see in materialization systems, you just you would inline the predicate operator directly into to the scan operator. Right? You, you can do this for other things as well. Like if you want to do, um, if this data needs to be sorted, you know, don't materialize it as an output buffer then pass it into a sort operator, you could inline that as well. So I say this every year where, where I say uh, this is a materialistic model is, is, is good for OTP, bad for OLAP. But there are two OLAP systems that uh, implemented this. Um, and one of them still does. So HiRISE was an academic system out of Germany that implemented the materialization model. MinoDB is a, one of the first academic column stores that used a materialization model. HiRISE rewrote them, they rewrote it, and then they switched to the, the vectorized model that comes next. MinoDB still uses materialized, uh, materialization model. Um, and then this is kind of sad, but the guy that invented MinoDB, he passed away, I think, last year. But then there would be people in India who would watch these videos, and then and I would say, like, yeah, this, they shouldn't have done it this way. Then they emailed Martin and, and complained to him that Andy said this, and then he had to like, respond to them, and he, he complained to me. Uh, but he, he was, he was steadfast. No, it's not a joke. It's like, he was steadfast on, on the materialization model, still in MoDDB. But as far as I know, no OLAP system does this, because it seems insane. To, like, uh, you have to do heavy inlining of, of the operators to avoid having excessive copying from, from you know, one, one operator to the next. Right? So again, this is great for OTP, because if everything's in memory, uh, and you, you know you're passing around a small number of tuples from one operator to the next, like go get Andy's you know, bank record. You know, it's a, sing a single account record. It's only one tuple pass getting passed along. Um, so you don't pay that overhead of, well, I guess if you're, you're only calling next once, it doesn't matter. But like, there's the, you, know, you, you get better performance if you, if you know you're only passing a small amount of data because it's one call to get everything and then you never go back. Whereas next, you have to sort of set up the iterator, some, some memory context. It's, it's a bit more involved. All right, so again, two extremes. Iterator model is one tuple at a time. Materialization model is all the tuples at a time. And then the solution for us in OLAP that we're going to use is going to be somewhere in the middle. And this is what the vectorization model is. So it's like the iterator model, where everybody implements a next function, assuming you're going top down. I'll explain what that is in a second. Um, but instead of returning back a single tuple, you return back a batch of tuples. And again, it could be a, 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 the entire tuple materialized. It could be the, just the columns that you actually need going forward, whether or not you're doing late or early materialization. But then the, uh, the loop now that's going gonna, gonna, gonna to get this batch of tuples, and it can process, this, process them. And then this is going to allow us to take advantage of, of SIMD, of vectorization, because now we have multiple tuples to, all at the same time. And then we, we can use vectorization to apply our, uh, apply our predicates or whatever we want on, on those batches, instead of like having to call next and look, look at a single tuple and then not be able to take advantage of, of SIMD. All right. All right. So it's, Again, same query, same idea. But again, now the, the idea is that in our next function, as we go down, uh, they're passing up uh, some vector. And so in our for loop, when the vector gets to the size that, that is our threshold, then we, then we send it back up. Right? And then we then call next on us again and get more. Same thing going down this side. And again, we, can do that, we could do that same inlining uh, optimization we had before. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. All right. All right, so this is idea for OLAP because it, it's the best of both worlds. It's going to allow us to get batches of tuples, uh, but not all the tuples. So we reduce the number of next calls we have to make, but, the, but, you know, but not the overhead of calling next over and over again. And this is what pretty much every modern OLAP system, this is, again, this is just a small, small, uh, small sampling, but these are the major ones. This, every modern OLAP system implements things this way. Surprisingly, CockroachDB 
even though they're not designed, they're at least they're not selling themselves to be a uh, an OLAP system. They have a blog article that describes how they use a vectorized model, even though they're targeting transactional workloads. With, I mean, they do they do support analytical things, but uh, you know they're not a column store, but they still do a vectorized model. So the, going forward, the, this is the right way to do this. All right. So any questions about the processing models? All right. So I already said this uh, as a as a spoiler, but we're going to go through it in more detail now. In all the examples that I showed before, the the way we executed the query in our different processing models was always start at the root, call next or whatever the, the invocation function is, and then that root operator would call next on its children operators and would percolate down into the query plan. All right? And it, essentially, you're pulling up data from the, the leaf of the, of the tree up into the, to, to the root, because you need that's where you produce the output to the client. Um, and this is how most database systems are going to implement uh, query execution, but it's, it's not the only way. So the, the approach that I've shared before, this is called top to bottom, also called a pool-based approach, where again, the idea is you're pulling data up from the children to the top, right? And in this case here, you always have to pass the data from one operator to the next through function calls. Right, because I, 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 there's an operator I implemented as these sort of abstract plan node type or operator type, and I just know I have a sequence of them. I, I know my children pointers are, and it's called next on them, and they bring me back some tuple. And the the idea with relational algebra is that you don't care what the actual data, or sorry, what the operators are below you. You just know that the, the contract and the APIs they're they're going to return back tuples. Right, so th this is why you implement as always in functions. The alternative is to do bottom to top. Uh, and the idea here is that you start invocation of the query by invoking or initiating execution at the leaf nodes themselves. And then they're going to then generate some output that they then push to their, uh, their, 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 their parents. And then once the, these, these, these leaf nodes are done producing their output, you never have to go back and, and invoke them again. So you'll see this in the next paper. In the, the next paper you guys are reading is on, all right, not, not actually next week. Next, next class is on query scheduling, and then after that is query compilation. The query compilation paper you're going to read is from Hyper. I want you to, the, the main focus of the paper is query compilation, but he describes how you do push-based execution in this. He's like, that's how awesome the Germans are. It's like he wrote a paper by himself, mind you, right, with three kids. Um, he wrote a paper himself on, like, here's the way to do query compilation with LLVM, and it's like, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a seminal paper in this area. Uh, but then he's also, oh, by the way, here's all this push this thing you should be doing too. It's insane. Uh, we did, this, we did a, a, a variant of this in, in our own system we'll cover. The old system we, we'll, that we have we'll cover later on. Um, but Hyper, uh, sort of the, the, the most recent system that started off this new wave of people using push-based execution. DuckDB used to do pool-based execution, uh, but then there's, there's a GitHub issue or, uh, from Mark, where he describes how we should be switching to push base, and they did that uh, in the last two years. Um, so again, he describes all the reasons why you want to do this. There's, again, it doesn't come for free. There's other things you have to worry about. Uh, and then Snowflake is based on this as well. You use a push based approach. So let's see now how we do a uh, bottom to top push based execution using the iterator model. So again, we, we think about the query plan in terms of pipelines. Right? The first pipeline here is we're going to scan R, and then assuming we're doing a hash join, we'll build the hash table for on, on, on the build side of the join, this side of the join. Then the second pipeline will scan S, apply our, our predicate, then do the probe in the hash table, then do our projection. So the first pipeline, if you want to do a push based approach, is just a for loop, and then you build the hash table. Right? Nothing fancy there. But you, all you have to do is just invoke this, this, this function. It says, here's the operator. Just execute it. And then once this thing, the, the data system it, uh, is notified that, hey, this operator is done, then the next pipeline is just this for loop here where you iterate every tuple in S. And then now you do all the things going up the, the query plan that I was talking about before. Like you try to ride the tuple up the query plan at every single operator as long as it keeps evaluating to true whatever, is, whatever it is that you want to do. So the first thing you do is evaluate the predicate. If that evaluates to true, then you put up the hash table. If there's a match, then you go ahead and do the projection. All right? 
So again, in, in this example here, I'm assuming there's, there's always going to be at least one, uh, at most one tuple that will match in the hash table, right? Because obviously, if you get back multiple matches, this needs to be a four beside of this, but we, we can ignore that. So what's a, what's a potential uh, benefit of this? Well, what's, what's one obvious benefit? I've already said. It's like the materialization model where there's no function calls for next, next, and next, right? I invoke this, it completes, and then I invoke this, and it's done. And I'm showing it here, I'm showing it for, uh, you know, two by a time in the iterator model. Uh, we have a paper that you could do this actually in batches in a vectorized approach and sort of blend the two. It requires a little more work at the stage buffers, but, uh, but again, the hyper paper you guys read will, will show you how, how they do this. And one of the big benefits they talk about is uh, not just trying to keep data in CPU caches, but keep data in CPU registers as you go from one, 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 you know, one sort of stage of the, of the, inside the for loop to the next. And that's really fast, because like, it's way faster than L1, of course. Right? So he says, in this case here, pipeline two still has to wait for pipeline one. Yes, because you, you can't probe the hash table until you finish building it. But that was true regardless of whether it was push-based or pull-based, right? Like, there's, there's no magic to make that, like, you can't magically make that not have to build the hash table. You have to, see, you have to build the hash table because it's, it's a dependency. Yes. So, so the statement is, uh, this basically breaks the query plan into multiple pipelines. Yeah, but how do you break it? Is there some logic that can help you? Yeah, his question is, how do you break it? So uh, I'll cover this more maybe next class. Um, the data system knows where the dependencies are. Like, that's what he was saying. I have, to, I have to finish building the hash table before I can probe it. So we call those pipeline breakers, right? I can't take a tuple from R and go all the way up because I have to, I'm on this side of the join. I'm building the hash table. I have to build the hash table, and then I'm done. That's the pipeline breaker. And then once this pipeline is done, then I can execute the next pipeline. So the data system knows what it's doing because it's, again, this is the beauty of SQL and declarative query languages. The data system knows what the SQL query is, knows what the query plan is, and knows exactly what you're doing. So it's not some arbitrary like, C function that like, you send it and you've never, it's never seen before. It knows exactly what the one stage is, how to move data from one stage to the next. So it knows where the pipeline breakers are. So it, it, can, it can orchestrate these things appropriately. Yes. Uh, so the question is, between a, a pool-based and a push-based approach, is there a difference in terms of parallelization uh, within a pipeline itself or across the whole system? Well, okay, we'll get to this in a second. But like, so yeah, so I'm not showing anything about parallelization here. So I'm not, like, again, this is just high level. I, hey, here's this pipeline. It's a for loop. I can easily you know, have multiple cores and scan this, uh, you know, scan a table different chunks of it in parallel and produce output, right? So, th so you can do intro query parallelism, right? So that's horizontal parallelism. In terms of vertical parallelism, you can't do that in this example here because I can't execute this before this executes. In some cases, I may be, may be able to do that. We'll see an example in a second. Yes. From the bottom to the top, and then in the push, you're doing it from top to bottom. So let's consider the case where you're doing parallelization only for these two, right? Yes. So can you achieve the best performance for both of them? Uh, so what do you mean? Like, can you achieve the best? Like, what do you mean? I mean is one better than the other? Is one oh, this question is one. One of these approaches is better for the parallelization for another. Yeah. Um, next slide. Uh, I don't think it matters. Right. If the, the challenge is going to be one of these approaches will be better. Like, so the, the push-based approach, it's, it's hard to do sort merge join because you need two iterators over sorted tuples that sort of go, you call next on, right? And you can't easily do that in, in a, in a push-based approach. In a pull-based approach, you can. Um, in a pull-based approach, it's easy to implement limit because, again, as I said before, if I don't need any more tuples at the root, I, just call, I stop calling next and the query is done. In a push-based approach, you don't, like, the, the pipeline may have to produce all its results uh, before it can figure out, okay, I, I don't need anything else, right? Why can't we like, push down the limit to... It depends on like, what pipeline it is. So, like, 
Again, going back here, uh, now it works. Uh, in this case here, the limit clause doesn't help you because you have to populate the hash join entirely before moving to the next one. In this case here, you'd have to, uh, and this, this example is simple enough. If you, if you had the limit clause in here, you could stop. Uh, if you have, once you're having multiple pipelines, it becomes more tricky. Right? So again, assuming everything's in memory, there's, there's, there's no more branching. Uh, well, there's still branching in, in, inside the, the, the pipeline itself, but I don't have that next call over and over again because I just, I just call go on the, on the pipeline, the push-based model, and then it, when it's done, it's done. The, we'll see this when we talk about query compilation. This, this is basically an example of code specialization because assuming I can generate this code, I, you know, I, just, I just execute it. I don't have to do a, like a vir virtual function table lookup, assuming it's implemented C++, to say, OK, I'm calling next on this operator. Uh, and it's, it's, it's an abstract type uh, that implements the next function. I don't have to then do a, you know, a function table lookup to say, OK, what's, what's the actual implication of that, the implementation of that, of that function I want to execute? There's none of that in here because it's just like, boom, 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 do exactly what I want to do. It's, I, mean, I, don't, I didn't want to try to bring up too much about code compilation. Uh, because you can do this without code compilation, of course, but you get amazing benefit, uh, performance benefits if you because you can easily imagine a system that could, that could code gen this. Okay, so that's again we spent most of our time on processing models. Let's let's finish up and talk about query execution because this is or parallel query execution because this is showing up in a bunch of the things that we're that we're talking about. Again, this is again another crash course of like the basic ideas of how to do of parallel execution, and then we'll see uh, when we talk about different, uh, different sort of algorithms, especially for the joins, we'll see how they do it in parallel and you understand like, in what context we're describing. Like is it within a single, single tuple, sorry, within a single operator, within a single query? Uh, we'll see that, that, how, how that all fits together. So again, it's obvious that the database system wants to execute multiple tasks at the same time to prove hardware utilization. I, if I have, uh, you know, if I have eight cores and I have eight tasks, and seven of those tasks finish up, and there's one last one that's still running, I don't want to have those seven cores just waiting, right, for the for the straggler. I want to have them doing something. So that that's the goal here. And the 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 tasks that we want to execute don't have to be from the same query. Some systems do that; they only execute one query at a time, uh, but most systems don't do that. So there's two types of parallelism. There's inter-query parallelism and intra-query parallelism. And then with the intra-query parallelism, we'll have different types of operator parallelism. So again, we'll, we'll go through uh, each of these one by one. And again, this is independent of what the processing model or whether it's top to bottom or bottom to top approach uh, for the system. So inter-query parallelism is sort of obvious. It's basically, I want to have multiple queries running at the same time. Right. Most systems do this by first come first serve. Like so, whatever query shows up first, they'll try to process that, uh, give that higher priority versus the ones that come later. We'll see when we talk about Redshift, they actually have multiple. They have a fast queue and a slow queue, or slow slow query queue and a fast query queue, because um, you want to try to finish the fast queries as, much, as fast as possible. So the challenge is going to be in OLAP queries is that they're going to have sort of parallelizable phases and non-parallelizable phases. So a parallelizable phase would be that those scans I was saying, I can run those in parallel and you know, populate some hash table. But at some point, I may have to coalesce the results, obviously maybe like the root of the query plan, because I have to send back a single, single answer to the, to the client. So something needs to be able to wait till I get results and combine everything together and produce my output. So again, we want to keep everything, uh, the system active at all times. So we'll just talk about how to multiplex queries across different cores or within the cores and how to schedule them at next class like using coroutines and other techniques. So that's, that's what we'll, we'll focus on uh, in next class. So I, I don't want to say too much about this right now. So instead, we'll talk about within a single query, how do we actually parallelize, parallelize things? So the two approaches are to intraoperator parallelism. So that's horizontal parallelism. So again, it's scaling out uh, a single operator to multiple operator instances. And then interoperator parallelism, the vertical parallelism, that's what he was referring to. Like, could I have... The, the data system execute different parts or different pipelines for the same query in parallel at the same time. And you can combine these together. They're not mutually exclusive. Uh, again, because we have, a, uh, we have the query plan inside the data system, we know exactly what the operators are trying to do. We know where they want to, what, what data they require as input and output. So we, the data system is responsible for figuring out, and it can, can figure out how, how to 
where, where it can exploit uh, parallelism for these things. So intraoperative parallelism is the most common one. And so the idea is that, again, for the single operator, we just make multiple instances of it that are going to do the same steps, the same operations on different portions of the table. Right, so again, think of like uh, we talked about how I could break up my, my, my database table into a bunch of files uh, that are you know, separate parquet files or whatever. And I could then have a separate operator instance be responsible for processing data within one of those files. So they're from the same table, which is different threads or, or skating different files. And then we're going to introduce this exchange operator in the query plan, a sort of a synthetic barrier to indicate the, the, where the end of the pipeline is. And that's a, it's a um, sort of a meeting point for the different threads or the different tasks that are running to say, okay, we, have to, we can't proceed in the query plan until we get all the results that this exchange operator uh, requires. And this exchange operator, this comes from the Volcano paper. Like, this is what they introduced to how to support uh, parallel execution, uh, horizontal intraoperative parallelism uh, in, in query plans. So I'll say also, too, you'll see this in the, uh, this technique in the Morsels paper you guys read next class from the Hyper guys. Right, where they're, they're basically they're breaking the data into blocks that they call morsels, and they're having threads uh, sign tasks of these operator instances um, on, on these different morsels. All right, so we have a simple query here, join A and B with a simple where clause. So say we start on this side of the query plan, that we're going to have a bunch of uh, in operator in invocation or operator instances of the scan on A. And we'll sign these to separate workers. Think of cores, could be CPUs or nodes. It doesn't, doesn't matter for this point here. Then the next step is that in our pipeline, we want to do our, uh, do our filter, right? So the data from this, the scan on A just feeds immediately into our, our filter. And again, I'm not saying whether it's push, push or pull or, or iterator or, or volcano. It's just, this is the pipeline. This is what we're doing. So then we have the, uh, we can push down the projection. And so this, this is optional, but the data systems could recognize that Maybe the, 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 the tuples on A are really wide, like 1,000 or 10,000 columns. So rather than pa passing around 10,000 columns, if I'm doing early materialization, I could do the projection inside of this. Then they build the hash table. And then above this, we're introduced an exchange operator, right? because we need to know that the hash table has been, complete, uh, been built by all the operator instances for the scan on A before we tell the, 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 the system to begin executing the next pipeline. So you can think of each of these, you know, this is the pipeline, scan A on, and then do the filter, and then build the hash table. But each of these would be a, again, a separate task or an invocation of the pipeline. All right, and then I have to point something here. So exchange is basically going to get in and say, OK, now, now I'm ready to do the join, because my hash table is built. OK, and also, too, I'm not saying here whether is it a single hash table, or is it a, or is it a partition hash table. That comes later when we talk about hash joins. For our purposes now, it doesn't matter. Same thing here over here. So we're going to scan on B, uh, then do the filter uh, with the projection pushed down. And then now we're going to probe the hash table. And again, these are all going to be separate invocations that can run separate threads at the same, at the same time uh, simultaneously. And then up above, we'll have an exchange operator because this is the output we need to produce to the, to the, to the client. So this exchange operator just basically is waiting to hear back that all, all three operator instances or all three pipelines have completed, and there's no more output that it's waiting for, you can coalesce the results and then produce the, the, the final answer to the client. Right? And so we'll cover next class, like, you know, for, for the scan on A, how many, how many cores, how many, how many instances should I use? It depends. It depends on what the size of the data is, how selective it is. Uh, it depends on what the hardware can support. Right? These are things that the data system can decide at runtime. The question is, how would you do sorting? Uh, so sorting would be a, uh, you would have it above the an exchange operator, because you have to wait till you get all the results before you can start sorting it. And then if you have a parallel sort, you could do that. But then again, depending on what's above you, you may need another, another exchange operator above it. Sorting would be an example of like a, it's a pipeline breaking operation. All right, so the next time of parallelism is, uh, Interoperator parallelism, a vertical parallelism. And again, this is just we have different uh, we have different operations that are di in different parts of the, of the query plan, 
that we can actually execute at the same time because we don't need to maybe materialize the results uh, immediately as part of the output. So you can sort of have like almost like a, uh, a producer consumer model where you have some pipeline that's running over here and it's producing tuples as this output, and then, and then it, it doesn't care where it's going. And then at the same time, there's another uh, there's a, there's another thread running the consumer of the video output, and this runs and does whatever he wants to do as well. So this is called pipeline parallelism because you're trying to parallelize the execution of of different pipelines in the system. So not in, not different invocations of the same pipeline, but just different completely separate pipelines. So th this is a uh, this is a contrived example, but I want to join A, B, and C, and D together without a where clause. So say I have a bushy query plan where I'm going to join A and B, join C and D, and then take the output of that uh, and join that together. So you can imagine a, a query plan that looks like this, where each of these is going to be their own separate, uh, uh, you know, own, own separate pipeline that's going to be executing, right? So I do the A and B. I'm not saying whether I do A and B in parallel or like just to say I'm just executing this one thread. At the same time, doing C and D. And then the output of these uh, could then be maybe partitioned or, ha or hash partitioned or divided up that like maybe some of the tuples that, that are hashed here, or sorry, some of the tuples that are joined here and joined over here go over here, and other ones go over the other one. And therefore, I know that I don't have any. Uh... Actually, I take that back. This is a Cartesian product. If there's no where clause, it's a Cartesian product. So we're just trying to mash everybody with everybody. So that's why you can do this completely in parallel. So you'll send the data. Uh, you duplicate the data to the dip, to dip, different sides, and just everybody gets joined together. Again, this is like a, this is like a contrived example. You, you wouldn't want to do this in a real system, but like this is how you could actually implement it. Because there's no data dependencies other than, uh, or there is data dependencies. Like these guys are just spinning, waiting, waiting for output. You typically see this in the streaming systems, um, where it's like it's like a constant stream of of of, of or with continuous queries. There's a constant stream of data coming in. And there's some predicates or some evaluation you're doing on it, and it's always producing output. And the query never dies or never ends because there's, there's it just it's like as I get more data, produce more output. So again, you don't typically see this in uh, in sort of OLAP systems that we're talking about here because of the pipeline breakers because you have those dependencies. Okay. All right. So to finish up. As I said before, uh, the main takeaway from the, the Monet B paper you guys read is that the easiest way to implement something is may not be the best way to actually implement it for, for modern CPUs. Uh, in particular, again, the paper you guys read was focused on superscalar CPUs, but that is the defining architecture of today's CPUs. There's the, you know, there's the, the, the performance cores and the efficiency cores. The, the, the technique still, still matters for those different kinds of cores. It's just now it's more complicated because there's, there's more variation in them. But the idea is still the same. And that branchless thing that I showed before will still work on, on today's, today's hardware. The vectorized and bottom-up execution approach going forward probably is going to be, in most cases, the better way to execute OLAP queries. The hyper guys are going to make very hard claims that this is the case. Uh, we'll see the Snowflake paper does this. DuckDB now d does it. But it, I think the paper you guys read, they don't do that. Um, but we'll see this again throughout, throughout the entire semester. And it shouldn't, the, the algorithms we'll talk about when we do joins, or par also the parallel execution stuff, it doesn't, it's not going to matter whether it's bottom up or, or top down uh, for, the, for the things that we care about in this class. But we'll see in, in the case of the hyper paper, they're going to make a big deal about keeping things in CPU registers. OK? All right. So next, next class, we'll talk about actually query task scheduling, how to decide for a bunch of queries, which ones I should run, how to then decide within my query if I have a bunch of these tasks now, which ones do I run, and where do I run them. And then we'll talk about code routines and how to maybe uh, allow one thread to run multiple tasks at the same time. Uh, not, you know, not exactly the same time, but have be processing multiple tasks at the same time, where one, if one task can't get any data, it then yields itself, and then the next task runs. And then this is a void having to go back to the OS uh, to, to, you know, to reschedule things. OK? Yeah. And then apparently you have already completed project number one. <laughs> That's my favorite all time. Uh, <laughs> no. What is it? Yes. It's the SP Cricket IDES. I make a mess unless I can do it like a geo. 
Ice Cube with the G to the E to the T. Now here it comes, dope. I play the game where there's no rules. Homies on the cup, so y'all a fool cause I drink fruit. Quick to bust a cap on the eyes, bro. Bushwick on the go with a blow to the eyes. Here I come. Willie D, that's me. Rolling with Fifth Watch, South Park, and South Central G. And St. Eyes when I party. By the 12 pack case of the four. Six pack 40 act gets the real bounce. I drink fruit, but yo, I drink it by the 12 ounce. They say Bill makes you fat. But St. Eyes is straight, so it really don't matter. <laughs>